I was active in the civil rights movement for a while. In the summer of 1964, I went to Mississippi. There was a Mississippi Freedom Summer, which was intended to organize and register voters um, and to reorganize the Democratic Party. But um, it was one of the organizing groups was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee. And um, and it was on, on our end, it was supposed to be a nonviolent summer. One of the organizing groups of the Freedom Summer was SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Organizing Committee. And we were all trained in nonviolence in the simple sense of um, if you're being attacked, what should you do? You should lie down on the ground and assume a fetal position. Um, and so these are my earliest memories is uh, in the in the United States, <clears throat> the civil rights movement, particularly coming out of Martin Luther King, had nonviolence as one of its principles. Yes. Then, of course, things got complicated, but that's my earliest memories of nonviolence in my life. In the United States, um, young men at that time were drafted into the army and you were allowed to uh, object through matters of conscience and, um, and not go into the army, but do some other alternative service. But you had to go before your draft board and explain what, what your conscientious objection was. And uh, that summer, I, I was a CO, as we call them, and um, the morning I was to go before my draft board, my mother woke me up and told me that Bobby Kennedy had been shot. So the same day I was going to try to explain why I was not in favor of violence, uh, we had a, a, a serious murder in this country. And it may be one of the reasons why when I got to the draft board, they really had no questions. They just said, I see you want to not fight. Well, that's okay. We'll have we'll do something else with you. <laughs> so I was all prepared for philosophical arguments about what would happen if my loved ones were murdered, but they never came up. I vote because voting is the nonviolent way that we preserve or change our system. So in a way, I don't think people necessarily connect voting and nonviolence, but in fact, a part of the point of voting is that this is how distributed power uh, can be organized to do something uh, without uh, violent means. I mean, every day there's something in the paper about um, people whose financial interests means that they are denying climate change or they are getting rich off of uh, manipulating the market in, in medicine and healthcare. Uh, and all these things fit into your definition of the structural violence of the marketplace. Um, and to the degree that capitalism uh, is an engine of profit making without any sense of uh, ethical constraints, it is, a, it is a system of violence. How am I dealing with dark times? I mean, it, it's important to me to keep something front and center that I really love and care about. And so the natural world and the life of butterflies <laughs> is in this category. But then it's important for me also to find the ways in which this uh, connects to the dark times we're in. And uh, so to the degree I'm writing about this, I'm simultaneously writing about uh, the wonder of natural history and the puzzles of how to how to, ha how to begin to have uh, a culture that can think about climate change sufficiently to begin to have agency. Um, yeah. Because, you know, the real problem is we have neither economic nor political agency that can deal with what's going on. I think there are many situations in which the suppression of debate and argument as a public form uh, is, a, is a kind of violence and leads actually to physical violence, that people become frustrated and they feel the only way that they can have an outlet for their position is yeah. to attack each other people. And, and you have to figure out how to have, uh, how to reduce the polarization such that people actually will talk to each other.